Excellent. Uh, can, uh, can you hear me okay, Andy? Yes, thank you. Great. Um, I want to uh, say good evening and welcome to everyone to the uh, Newburyport Zoning Board of Appeals uh, agenda meeting of October 13th, 2020. Um, just to give uh, those who might be just logging on as attendees an overview of how these meetings work. We have um, uh, via Zoom, everyone uh, listed under the panelist bar are our members of the Zoning Board of Appeals, as well as our city planner, our planning director, uh, and our, um, our keeper of the minutes. I'll go through uh, in a moment and introduce the board and then we will go through our agenda uh, and I'll walk everyone through um, exactly how the process of, uh, of a Zoom uh, municipal meeting is run, at least uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals anyway. And uh, I'll basically outline for everyone the format of, uh, of our hearings this evening. We have a few matters that are on the agenda that have been uh, subject to um, requests for continuances by the applicant or the applicant's representative. We'll deal with those first and then we'll get into the first full public hearing. Uh, and uh, before we do any of that, I'll, uh, again, I'll walk everyone through the, uh, the quick outline and we'll jump right in. Um, so uh, beginning this evening, I'm gonna start with the roll call and we're gonna work from the meeting agenda. We're gonna take the roll call, establish that we have a quorum. There are five uh, voting members of the Newburyport Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, there is a minimum of four votes in the affirmative that is required for any application to, uh, to be successful. Uh, but I'll go through and, uh, and we'll do our roll call, our business meeting where we approve our minutes from our last hearing of 922. Uh, and then what we will do in the, uh, in the business portion of the meeting is we will address the one and only uh, minor modification request on 66, uh, 66 Story Avenue, after which we'll go into our public hearings dealing with our continuances first and then our full public hearing uh, immediately thereafter. So without further ado, um, I'll uh, introduce the uh, members of the board. Uh, in attendance this evening, we have uh, Mr. Mark Moore, our vice chair, uh, Mr. Stephen Delisle, our secretary, Ms. Rachel Webb, uh, ZBA member, Mr. Ken Swanton, uh, ZBA member, and Mr. Brendan ben Banovic, our associate member. I believe uh, Walter Bud Channon is absent this evening. And my name is Rob Champetti. I'm the chairman. Uh, and uh, for those of you that are just logging on, uh, welcome to the ZBA meeting of October 13th, 2020. So um, beginning, I'm gonna call the roll and if you uh, if members of the ZBA can just respond in saying either here uh, or uh, present, uh, we'll, uh, we'll see who we have uh, and if we have a quorum. Mr. Moore. Present. Mr. Delisle. Present. Ms. Webb. Present. Mr. Swanton. Here. Uh, Mr. Banovic. Present. All right, and Rob Chair. Uh, Mr. Shagnon is on. Oh, yes. Okay, great. And Mr. Chan. I'm here. Yes, present. Excellent. Um, okay, so the uh, voting members this evening, the five required voting members will be uh, Mr. Moore, Mr. Delisle, Ms. Webb, uh, Mr. Swanton, and myself. Um, there is one application at the very end of this uh, agenda, uh, which I uh, have to recuse myself from, so I will be turning over the gavel to, uh, to our Vice Chair, Mr. Moore. That's the matter of, of uh, 468th Street. When I do, the fifth voting member will, um, will become uh, Mr. Channon. So with that, uh, we have a quorum. Uh, we also have in attendance this evening, uh, Ms. Caitlin Sullivan, our city planner, uh, Mr. Andy Port, our planning director, and our keeper of minutes, Ms. Gretchen Joy. So uh, without further ado, we'll move into the business meeting. Uh, we have from Ms. Joy the minutes from the hearing of 922 before us. Uh, this is the point of the, uh, the business meeting when I, um, while I'll listen from any of the members of the CBA, if there are any comments or changes or revisions. Uh, and uh, if so, uh, just please uh, un un unmute your, your mic and uh, feel free to let us know. Any, uh, any yes. comments? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, it's Rachel Webb. I have um, three edits. Um, the first is under um, item two, the request for minor modification for 162 State Street. Um, let's see, one, two. On the sixth line where the sentence starts in response to a question um, by, it should say by Ms. Webb, not for Ms. Webb. <clears throat> the applicant estimated the mature trees are 40 feet high. The second change would be on that same page under item C, which was uh, 190 High Street. The third line down should say a uh, curb cut that would allow access to the right side. So I don't think you need the word two there. <clears throat> 
And then um, on the second page under the public hearing, the 28th Summit Place, um, the second paragraph, one, two, the fifth line, it says the area in the back, you should add the words in the back. So it reads, the area in the back is used to keep the dogs away from the street. <clears throat> and then further down, um, Mr. Champetti, if you wanted to comment on the part where you were proposing, it says Mr. Champetti said the proposed location would, I think you meant to say be appropriate for the lot. There's a couple of extra words in that sentence. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, it should just read be uh, appropriate for the lot. Yep. That's it. Uh, okay. Um, any I'm other? Sorry. I'm sorry. There's one more. Sure. <laughs> on, on the uh, third page, um, the last line of the first paragraph, um, the addition would not be detrimental because of the lot size. It says just detriment. Okay. Add the word. Add the letters A L. So the word is detrimental. That's it. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Um, any other uh, comments uh, or any other comments with respect to the proposed changes uh, by uh, by Ms. Webb? Uh, hearing none. Um, okay. Uh, do we have a, a motion to approve the minutes? I'll move we approve the minutes. Ken Swanton. Seconded, Mr. Moore. Okay, the motion is made by uh, Mr. Swanton and seconded by Mr. Moore. I'll call the roll and you can just respond uh, with either I or yes or no. Um, Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Ms. Webb? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Uh, Mr. Channing? Yes. Mr. Branovic? Yes. And uh, Rob Champetti, I vote yes. Uh, with respect to the minutes, uh, that's uh, seven in the affirmative. The motion carries, the minutes are approved. Um, moving to the next item uh, in the business meeting, we have a request for a minor modification on the application of 66 Story Avenue. Uh, it's uh, docket 2014-054, and I understand uh, on behalf of the applicant uh, speaking this evening, we'll have, we have uh, Ms. Jessica Keyes. Uh, may we hear from uh, the applicant, Ms. Keyes? And yes, I'm here. We'll, uh, can you hear me? Oh, great. We can hear you. Thank you. I can't see you guys. <laughs> uh, we we um we we uh, do a an audio only um, Zoom meetings. Uh, okay, just making that's... sure. <laughs> yeah, not not everyone. I mean, any anyone's welcome to put their video up, uh, but not everyone. Uh, we found that not everyone's been able to. So to kind of level the playing field, so everyone has kind of equal equal sensory input. We just went um, audio yeah. only. No worries here. <laughs> Yeah, by all means, um, it, feel free to uh, feel free to to uh, tell us uh, your your proposal and your presentation for the minor mod. So the Provident Bank is now changing their branding. As you can see, it's completely different. Um, they are rebranding at all of their locations. We are actually going down in square footage on this sign. We're using the existing posts. Um, it's it's not an illuminated sign, which is why it was set for a minor modification. Hoping that everybody approves. Um, the pink I found that some people and some towns have had issues with, but they've approved because it's now going to be the bank logo. They're changing their name. They're completely rebranding. Okay. Uh, was there any, is there anything, um, anything else you wish to present uh, or, or tell us about? Is it pretty much self-explanatory in, in the, the sign yes. center? Interior? As you can see in the signage, we're basically taking the Provident Bank sign down in the green mm -hmm. and just replacing it with a carved out black sign. Okay. Um, it will be square and I know it's, any changes in the shape is typically an issue. Um, but it is, like I said, less in square footage. It's only 31 square feet, where I believe the other one was way larger. Um, I don't yeah. have in front of me how big it is. Ms. Keith, are, there any changes, are there any changes to the proposed lighting? I see ground lighting. Uh, I know that I, I actually was on the board uh, uh, when this sign was first approved and we, we had uh, approved the uh, granite uh, uh, 
pillars that create a monument ground sign. And I remember, believe it or not, because all of our signage, all of our freestanding signs have all migrated to this sort of style of, um, uh, of kind of passive lighting. We, we certainly don't want any internal light lit signs. Nothing's changing um, with respect to that. I can't tell by the design of bank. Nothing, I'm sorry. Is that no, nothing is changing for the lighting. It's, it's okay. going to be just a straight carved out sign, exactly the same as the Provident Bank sign is now. It's just different colors. Um, and okay. it's, it's, it's a bit smaller, but we'll still keep the lighting that's there now. And that's, that's not changing. Um, very good. Was there anything else before I um, before I poll the members of the ZBA for their thoughts and comments or questions? No, if anybody has any questions, please feel free. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Keys. Um, moving to the uh, ZBA um, members of the board, having heard the presentation uh, from uh, Ms. Uh, Keys with respect to the bank prov, the Provident Bank uh, sign minor modification, I'll just uh, move through our, our, um, um, our, uh, slate of, uh, of members and just uh, feel free to any questions or comments you might have. Uh, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman. I just wanted to, to make sure this is clear in my mind. So the, the move with the rebranding, the bank prov sign that's being proposed as shown in this um, updated application. So it, the sign itself will move from being an oval to the rectangular shape with bank prov or would that be Will bank probably be superimposed on an oval? It's it's a carved sign. Okay. It will be rectangular and not oval. Oval. Okay. I believe that that's what the request was initially re desired because it was changing the shape of the sign. Okay. Um, anything, uh, anything further, uh, Mr. Moore? Not at the moment. All right. Uh, Mr. Delisle? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with regard to the, to the shape, is um, the, the prior uh, uh, application from, uh, when was it? It was uh, 2014. Um, that was granted with an oval uh, the sign variance was granted for an oval shape. Is there a way that you can maintain that oval shape with the new uh, proposed uh, trade dress? So the customer is trying to, again, update their branding, change the complete logo. They've changed the complete name. They're looking for a, a more updated shape. Um, they're growing and they're hoping that everybody kind of takes the change. Okay, um, Mr. Lyle, anything further on that question? Uh, so that, I guess, yeah, I would just follow up with, so that means that the, uh, that the, the sign will be square and there's no, uh, there's no wiggle room for, to maintain the oval shape. I have proposed that to the client and they would like to keep the new square shape within all of their locations. And you will see we're also doing um, Amesbury, which I have more meetings to attend this month. <laughs> um, I've already done Seabrook and I believe Exeter and they're all within the same means as this sign here. I see. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Delisle. Uh, Ms. Webb. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I do have a concern about this because, um, you know, the original approval was for an oval shape and, um, you know, is it under that premise that this is considered a minor modification and because it's a change in shape, should we be considering it as a different kind of application? Maybe that's more a question for Andy Port. I, Ms. Webb, may I respond? I apologize for interrupting. I did bring this to the town and Caitlin had informed me that 
it should be only a request for a minor modification because of the shape change of the sign. Um, yeah, this is Andy. I could speak to that. Hi, Andy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I would note, by the way, Jennifer Blanche, our zoning administrator, is on, as well as Kaylin, our planner. Um, but just a quick synopsis. Um, if it was just the name change of the business, we would not consider that to be a change to the sign because that's just the business name changing. Um, so if the panel would remain the same as the Provident Bank existing one you're seeing, um, that would just be a name change. But in this case, because they're changing the, the style and shape of the sign um, that was the subject of the prior approval, uh, we essentially recommended, our staff recommended that go back to the board. That's consistent with um, revising something that was on plans approved by the board. So, um, and I'm sure Jennifer would echo the same thing. I don't know if she had anything to add to that, but bottom line is um, this is not something that um, the applicant could do without the board's approval. And um, to Rachel's question, I think the, the question of whether or not you want to approve the shape change um, obviously is, is somewhat within your discretion, given that it's the um, subject matter that was previously approved was the, the style and shape of that sign. Uh, we leave it to you as to you know where that should fall, but uh, we just wanted to make sure that the signage that was originally approved uh, went back to the board for modification since uh, it was encompassed by the prior permit. Okay, thanks, Sandy. And just to um, <clears throat> follow up, my main question was whether or not the sign was internally illuminated because um, although I can see the floodlight in the photo, it, it just looks like it could be illuminated the way um, the, the font style and the, just looks that way to me. But you're saying it's gonna be a wood material, is that correct? Yes, it's just an HDU uh, raised border panel carved out. It's non-illuminated. Okay. We're, keeping, we're keeping with the floodlight. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, anything further, Ms. Webb? No, that's it. Thank you. Great. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Um, yeah. Um, I guess a lot of the questions have been about the shape of this thing. Um, I, you know, I've been to your website and I noticed that you, uh, the bank's website, I should say, I noticed that they used to have this oval provident bank thing and they now are, have this kind of new look thing. I guess, I guess my, is it, you mentioned the other towns you've talked to. Is this a general change that, you know, for all your branding that you're going from oval to, to not oval? Is that basically how you're changing your brand? Yes. Okay. Well, that's kind of my question. Uh, I also noticed there's an attendee with their hands up, although I don't know if maybe this is just a modification, minor modification, Rob. I don't know whether we're take, whether you were taking questions from the attendees, but there's been uh, one person. I see that um, as well. Oh, I can't see anything. <laughs> I, um, I will, um, after we pull the board, um, I, I don't, I'll, I'll certainly acknowledge uh, a raised hand, though, though I will say um, that this portion of the, uh, of the hearing is the business meeting, uh, so we, it's, the public comment period is, um, is attached to each of the uh, public hearings that will follow, but I certainly want to acknowledge a raised hand. Right. I, I, assume, I assume that was probably the case. I just wanted to point it out. No, that was really my only question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see, Mr. Channing. Uh, no questions, Chairman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. And uh, Mr. Banovic. Yeah, I think uh, Rachel hit my question about the material of the sign, uh, the high density urethane, um, just keeping with the same uh, the same, besides the shape, the same kind of character of it. So um, I think I'm good, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Benevick, and, and I, I, I suppose as the, um, the only member of the board, um, my colleagues that, that actually was at this hearing <laughs> back in 2014, I, I remember this application, uh, as I'd mentioned earlier, um, and I remember uh, we, the, my colleagues on the board at the time uh, were, you know, fairly adamant in creating um, a very careful approach to freestanding signs, especially in this uh, in this entry corridor, which is seen as sort of a view corridor by those entering Newburyport. Um, and it was important to create kind of an aesthetic that we felt was commensurate with the city uh, and its architecture. Um, so this yeah. whole idea of a granite post uh, was part of that. I, I don't remember, to be honest, that we were terribly troubled by the shape, although it was an oval presented. I, I got to say, for me, I, I mean, I don't, you know, with greatest respect and we don't police, you know, we don't police um, aesthetics, right? But I, I, I you know, I, I don't 
need to really take a position on whether I like better or like worse the, the shape of the branding other than to say that it seems to be less um, massing in this configuration of a rectangle <clears throat> than the oval. Um, and so as long as it's not illuminated internally and as long as the materials are carved and um, you know foam core or something commensurate to a long-standing wood, I, I'm actually okay with with the minor modification proposal, um, despite the fact that I, you know, to be honest, I don't love the shape, but I kind of get it if it's a branding change. That, that's just my sentiment. Um, do um, do any members of the board have any further comments or questions uh, before I'll ask for a motion? I do actually. It's Rachel Webb. Um, I'm just noticing. I'm looking at the the graphic that's up on our screen. And the bank name there with the, um, it's below the photos in the, um, the footer area. You know, it's showing with the address and the, the B is uppercase and the letter P is uppercase. And yet in the sign, it's all lowercase. Hmm. Why is that different? It will be all lowercase in the sign, Ms. Webb. It's the way that we store things in our system is by our proofs they're stored in a, a specific format <clears throat> excuse me and we have to label them as such sometimes there's modifications in the way that we save them and unfortunately because we've done so much work for the provident bank prior to this we have so many files so we had to save it accordingly okay but it will be as stated in the sign proposal here just as you see it in the proposed picture, that is an actual, that is actually what it will look like once it's up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, any other comments from the members of the board? Um, hearing none, um, at this point, I see a raised hand among the attendees. Um, Andy, could you unmute the mic of Mr. Fred Needhart? And Mr. Needhart, if you can hear us, uh, just let us know. And he has been unmuted. He'll just have to need to do it on his end. Um, Mr. Needhart, if you can see at the bottom left of your um, Zoom screen, you should see an icon of a uh, of a microphone. If you could just click that. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hello. I did not uh, touch the microphone button to be recognized. I don't know what happened. Oh, um, my. So my apologies. And um, I uh, I think that if Andy, how does one lower their hand? It, it sounds like Mr. Needhart didn't. Sure, I can take care of that. I'll uh, I'll assist Fred with lowering his hand. Thank you, Fred. Very good. Okay, um, we just wanted to make sure that we addressed that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Needhart. Um, moving then back to the uh, board, do we have a motion uh, to approve? And and just to let those in attendance know now, uh, though I'll explain the rest of the format uh, in a moment, uh, because we operate under Robert's Rules of Order, uh, a motion to the, the way to move a an application along for a vote of the board is always under Robert's rules in the form of a motion to approve, which doesn't necessarily mean that anyone must uh, support it or vote to approve it. It's just the format, so it's semantics. And at uh, that point, uh, once it's seconded, we will poll the board uh, uh, as to their actual vote. So uh, with that, do we have a motion from the board on the minor modification to the signage? Uh, this is Mr. Delisle. I'll make the motion. Uh, the motion, a motion to consider the request minor and approve the minor modification to the variance for 66 Story Avenue, uh, uh, file number 214-054. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. I'll second it, Ken Swanton. Okay, motion, uh, thank you, Mr. Swanton. The motion is made by Mr. Delisle and seconded by Mr. Swanton to deem the, uh, the, the uh, request as a minor modification and uh, approve the uh, minor modification request uh, on 66 Story Avenue. I will uh, now call the roll. Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Ms. Webb? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. And Rob Champetti, I vote yes uh, as well. That's five in the affirmative, the ayes have it and the motion carries the, um, the uh, minor modification request is approved thank you very much uh miss uh, miss keys thank you all
All right, have a good evening. So moving thank on. You. Thank you. Moving on to uh, our next matter. Uh, this is where we'll move into the public hearings uh, this evening. Just to outline for those listening in, if this is your first time in a ZBA or any Zoom uh, municipal hearing here in Newburyport, the format is as follows. Um, I will read the, um, the, in the form of the public notice, I will read the agenda description by applicant name as well as uh, their representative, if they're being represented, the address and then the file number, uh, as well as a description of what the applicant is, uh, is, is requesting. Once I read the notice of the application, uh, we will then open it up to hear from anyone who is speaking on behalf of the application, whether it's the applicant uh, uh, herself or himself, or whether it is uh, someone on behalf of the applicant, uh, representatives such as the attorney, uh, architect, engineer, etc. After we hear the presentation from the applicant, we'll close that portion of the hearing at which point we open it up to public comment. Um, in the past, we have gone, you know, those who wish to speak in favor, then we've closed it and done those who wish to speak in opposition. Um, what we're doing now and what I'd like to do is simply, um, if you wish to speak, whether for or against, feel free to say so or say not at all, but really just voice your comments. We do ask when we open up the public comment section uh, to raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom uh, of your Zoom screen. Uh, Mr. Andy Port, our um, our uh, planning director uh, will um, will open up your mic and then just simply give us your name and your address so that our keeper of the notes will be able to record that and then just uh, feel free to tell us uh, what's on your mind. We do ask that each member of the uh, of the public in speaking to limit your remarks to under two minutes so that everyone will have an opportunity to speak. Um, after we close that portion of the public hearing, those who wish to speak for, against, or just speak, uh, we will go from quest we will go to questions from the board. This is when uh, members of the ZBA will pose questions uh, to the applicant, the applicant's representatives, oftentimes adapting questions that were posed by members of the public. So uh, members of the public, if that's uh, if you're if you're interested, that's that's how the questions you raise get manifest in the form of this process. Uh, members of the ZBA will will if they have that same question or they have some version of it, they'll ask that question and elicit that information. After which we'll close that portion of the hearing, and this is when we move to deliberations. Deliberations is the segment of the public hearing when members of the public and all those who are attending uh, get to listen to the ZBA, ZBA discuss the application uh, out loud. It's really when you get to hear us thinking out loud. Um, all of the maturations, discussions, questions, uh, and positions of the members will be voiced in, uh, and in the spirit of the open meeting law uh, in your full sort of observation and ability to listen in. Uh, after the uh, members of the ZBA have deliberated uh, on, the, um, on the details, we will close that portion of the public hearing, uh, at which point we will, uh, we will request that a member of the ZBA uh, move the matter along by making a motion to approve. And again, under Robert's rules, that's how it would be advanced. A motion will be made and then seconded, and then I'll call the roll. And the minimum of four votes in the affirmative is required for an application to be successful. Uh, so with that, we'll move uh, through the agenda. Uh, we have a couple of matters that have been, uh, we've received requests to continue. The first is the uh, matter of 193 High Street, uh, Hebelick Real Estate LLC, care of uh, Lisa Mead, Mead, Tellerman and Costa. A request has been received to continue the matter to the hearing of December 8th. Attorney Mead, do you wish to be heard or just wish us to proceed on the, on the request? Uh, please proceed on the request, thank you. All right, thank you, Attorney Mead. So um, we have a motion. Uh, this is Mr. Delisle. I'm gonna need to recuse myself from this matter. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Um, so uh, Mr. Delisle will recuse himself on, on that vote, uh, meaning that um, uh, Mr. Channon, you will be, um, you will step in as our voting fifth member. Uh, okay, so um, uh, we, uh, we have, uh, do we have a motion to, uh, to continue the matter of 193 High Street to the uh, meeting of 12-8-2020? <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll move to continue 193 High Street uh, appeal to the meeting of December 8th, uh, 2020. That's application 2019-042. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moore. Do we have a second? I'll second. I'll second that. That's Mr. Shagnon. Okay. Okay. A motion is made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Mr. Shagnon. Um, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle has recused himself. Ms. Webb. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Mr. Chagnon. Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That is five in the affirmative. The um, the ayes have it. The motion carries. And the matter is continued to 12-8-2020. Thank you. Um, next uh, is the matter of 68 Middle Street. Um, uh, that's Windward Shaw LLC, represented by Lisa Mead, Mead, Tellerman, and Costa. 
A request has been received by the ZBA to continue the matter to the meeting of October 27th. Attorney Mead, do you wish to be heard? Um, thank you. I, I'd just like to say that we have been uh, working hard with the neighbors, um, and Mr. Neathart is on here, uh, where the plans are being revised. And so um, in order to give us plenty of time to do that and get them into the board in time, we're requesting its continuance to 1027. Okay, thank you, Attorney Mead. Um, do we have a, uh, a motion to approve the request to continue to 1027? I'll make that motion. Go ahead. Rachel Webb uh, to continue the application of uh, 68 Middle Street uh, case 2020-53 to the meeting, ZBA meeting of October 27th. Thank you, Ms. Webb. We have a second. Seconded, Mr. Moore. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moore. Motion's made by Ms. Webb and seconded by Mr. Moore. Um, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. Five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. Motion carries. The matter is continued to the meeting of 10-27-2020. Uh, moving on uh, to the matter of 190 High Street. Uh, this was an appeal uh, brought by um, Mr. Eric Goodness. Uh, it is, um, we've received a re request to withdraw that matter. I don't know if we have uh, anyone who, to, who, who may be here on behalf of that application. Is there, a, Mr. Mr. Goodness, are you here and do you wish to be heard on the uh, request to withdraw? This is Andy Port. It does not look as if Eric Goodness is in the audience this evening uh, and I see no hands raised. Very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Port. Okay, so this matter we can just proceed on on the, uh, on the request. Uh, we also typically, as a ZBA, unless there's prevailing reason or request otherwise, uh, we'll always uh, consider a request to withdraw to be without prejudice. Um, and so I would uh, propose that we, uh, we append that to the request. Um, and um, is there, um, uh, do we have a, a motion by any member of the board or any comments with respect to that proposed change? Mr. Chair, this is Mr. Delisle. I'm going to recuse myself from this matter as well. Very good. Um, I will. Uh, so, Mr. Delisle has recused himself. Uh, Mr. Chagnon, you will um, you will move up to uh, fifth voting member for this request. Any um, further board comments uh, in the alternative? Uh, do we have a motion to approve? Right, this is Mr. Moore. I'll, I'll uh, make a motion to accept the withdrawal without prejudice uh, for 190 High Street appeal, uh, which is 2020-055. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Do we have a second? Second, Ken Swanton. Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Motion's made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Mr. Swanton. Uh, Mr. Moore? Yes. Ms. Webb? Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Chagnon? Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. Five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries. The matter um, is uh, the request to withdraw without prejudice uh, is uh, approved. Um, th and thank you. Um, finally, the, um, to just jump to uh, the next request to continue, it is the matter of 12-14 Harrison Street. Uh, the applicant, Michael Gray. Um, is Mr. Gray uh, in the audience and do you wish to be heard on the request? Uh, this is Andy again. I do not see Michael Gray or his attorney, David um, uh, Mack, in the audience, but uh, we do have the request, uh, and I see no hands raised. Thank you, Mr. Port. Okay, um, we have uh, the motion before the board to continue to 11, the meeting of 11-24-2020. Do we have a motion to approve? Uh, this is Mr. Delisle. I'll make that motion, uh, but I think the motion... Uh, would be to December 8th, 2020. Uh, so I'll make the motion to continue uh, the hearing on 12 through 14 Harrison Street uh, appeal to December 8th, 2020, and that's file number 2020-67. You are correct, yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Delisle. That's That should have been 12, the meeting of 12 8 2020 um, uh, Do we have a second? A second. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, who got that second? Sorry. It, Mr. Swanton did. Uh, all right, I'll take it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Swanton. Um, so the motion is made by Mr. Delisle and seconded by Mr. Swanton on the request to continue, the applicant's request to continue the application of 1214 Harrison Street to the meeting of 12 2020 Mr. Moore? Yes. Mr. Delisle? Yes. Ms. Webb? Yes. 
Rachel? Great. Yes, hello. Sorry, I lost internet there for a moment. No worries. Uh, and uh, Mr. Chadman? Yes. Uh, wait a minute, did I miss? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Swanton. And yes, me too. <laughs> Rob Campetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries. And the matter is, uh, the request to continue is uh, is approved uh, for to the meeting 12 8 2020. Uh, thank you all very much uh, for that bit of housekeeping. Um, so leaving then the first substantive matter in the public uh, the public hearings, we have the application of 284 Water Street. Um, the applicants, Timothy and Wendy Higgins, care of Sarah, attorney Sarah Wolf of Finneran and Nicholson PC. The uh, docket is um, application 2020-0666. This is a special permit for non-conformities to construct a screened in porch with insufficient front yard setback. And speaking on behalf of the applicant, uh, we have attorney uh, Sarah Wolf. Attorney Wolf. All right, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Sarah Wolf, attorney with Finner and Nicholson PC, as mentioned here tonight, also with Matt Langus of Scott Brown Architects. I'm representing my clients, the petitioners, Tim and Wendy Higgins, with respect to their application for a special permit for nonconformities. This is for the construction of a sunroom consisting of less than 500 square feet total, which would be extending the pre-existing non-conforming front yard setback. Uh, so as currently situated, the existing home is located on property, which we know as 284 Water Street, and this is located within the R2 zoning district, which is in the Joppa Flats area, overlooks the Merrimack River from the landward side of the street. The existing home, as it's currently situated, is on a lot which has over 20,000 square footage in lot area. Uh, only 10,000 square foot is required for the existing single family use. There are already in existence non-conforming front and rear setbacks but the property otherwise conforms to zoning uh, in all other respects. So with this application, the petitioner proposes to construct a one-story, single-story, 205 square foot enclosed porch, which would be located on the southerly side of the home, which fronts along Water Street. Uh, the front building wall of the proposed porch to be constructed will have a 14.5 foot setback from the front lot line. While the front building wall of the home right now is only nine feet from the front lot line at its closest point. So with regard to this application, the zoning administrator determined that due to the fact the, that the proposed upward expansion would extend that existing non-conforming front setback, the petitioners would be required to apply for a special permit for non-conformities pursuant to section 9B2A of the zoning ordinance of Newburyport. So with this regard, the criteria that have to be met are first, that there will be no addition of a new nonconformity, and second, that the proposed change or changes will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the pre-existing nonconforming structure or use already is. Um, so in this case, to address that first criteria, no new nonconformities are being created. Um, as for the second element of the criteria to be met, the proposed home with the additional sunroom would not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than the existing structure as the home currently stands. The proposed construction here would not intensify any existing nonconformities. This proposal is really only for an extension along the front building wall. The proposed addition, additionally, no pun intended, is proportionally quite small given the very large size of the lot that it's currently situated on. Uh, this addition will not affect any light, air, or views for the neighboring landowners. Um, neighbor on the side closest to the addition has no objection, nor do any neighbors that we know of. Um, this lack of any significant impact can be grounds for a finding that the structure would not substantially be more detrimental. Uh, supporting case law for this, I referred to Britain versus the Zoning Board of Appeals of Gloucester, 2003 case, which involved a board decision. Um, where the court upheld that a proposed project would be substantially more detrimental because the addition would have significant impact on the light, views, breezes, noises, odors, you name it. Um, right now though, I'm gonna let Matt take over, Matt Langus to talk about the specific details of the proposal, which he is most familiar with, and then I'll take it back and wrap it up. Matt, over to you. 
Great. Thank you, Attorney Wolf. Uh, good evening, everyone, members of the board. Uh, my name is Matt Langis, the project architect from Scott Brown Architects, uh, 38 Madison Street, Amesbury, for the record. Uh, to expand off of what Attorney Wolf had mentioned in her introduction, the project before you is a single story sunroom addition. It's approximately 205 square feet and extends off of the existing breakfast room at the front corner of the main house. What we are proposing remains in character with the old style colonial home. So we're showing tall, equally spaced windows with transoms above and a flat roof that's separated by layers of trim and measures at a height of 12 foot nine from the mean grade. Originally, the addition was intended for an entirely different location. If you're looking at the existing front elevation shown on page EC 2.1, uh, the plan for the initial design was actually to add it onto the smaller addition. So starting at the brick chimney and extending to the left. Uh, so although this addition uh, or this location rather would have eliminated any need for dimensional relief, we felt that it made the home quite long and that the new location shown on page A2.1 would not only be a more uh, appropriate in proportion, but also just have a much stronger architectural relationship to the main house. Um, with that, this concludes my purpose of the presentation, but I'm happy to address any questions or concerns. And if there are none, I will turn it back over to Attorney Wolf. Thank you, Matt. Um, so Matt actually added on really nicely there. Thank you very much. So based upon the foregoing from Matt and from myself, uh, the petitioner, you know, submits that the proposed structure won't be substantially more detrimental. It's not creating any new um, nonconformities, and we respectfully request that this board would grant um, petitioner's application for the special permit. If there are any questions, you know, I'm here to answer them. But that concludes our presentation. Okay, um, this is Chair Champetti. Thank you, Attorney Wolf, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Langus, um, for the presentation. Uh, now moving to the uh, next portion of the public hearing. Um, this is the uh, portion where we will ask any members, uh, any members of the audience who wish to speak uh, in either support or opposition or just simply wish to speak uh, with respect to the application. Uh, if you can just do, just simply make yourself known by uh, clicking uh, raise hand at the bottom of your screen and uh, we will acknowledge you. Anyone wish to speak for, or against, or just simply speak um, with respect to this application? Going once, going twice. Seeing no hands, uh, and I always try to delay that. We don't wanna, if someone's fiddling with a mic or trying to figure that out, we always wanna give them ample time to uh, be able to acknowledge us. If, by the way, if, uh, if you find yourself dealing with technology issues and, uh, and you miss sort of the boat as it were, just simply raise your hand, uh, we will acknowledge it and, and we will try to uh, address uh, even sort of a late hand raise if it's still in that same segment of the meeting. Seeing uh, no hands raised here, we will close that portion of the public hearing and go to questions from the board. Um, this is Mr. Moore. I have one, uh, well, a general question for Mr. Langus. Could you just go over the efforts uh, that are gonna be made to match um, the modest addition to the original house with respect to materials, windows, et cetera? Sure, absolutely. So um, we're using uh, the, the same exact, oh well, matching the existing siding and trim. Um, the, the windows right now are actually the, the same size. We're using sort of a, a similar style uh, sash, although that is a little bit uh, off from proportion with the transoms, but um, similar quality windows, similar trim. So uh, the trim, the, the windows and the siding are all meant to match the existing character of the house. Thank you. Very good. Um, thank you, Mr. Moore. Um, Mr. DeLisle. Uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't. I don't have any questions on this one. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. DeLisle. Uh Ms. Webb. Um, I have a question about the uh, flat roof and um, if you're planning to do some kind of a roof deck up there or not. There are no plans to do a roof deck at the moment. Uh, there's a, a window that's on the second floor is shown and, and the, the reason for doing the, the flat roof is to avoid any uh, possible intersection with that window. I see, thank you. 
Okay, thank you, Ms. Webb. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, no, I have no questions. All right, thank you, Mr. Swanton and uh, Mr. Channing. Uh, no questions, Chair. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, uh, I have no questions either. Um, so uh, we uh, can close that portion of the public hearing and move to board deliberations. And I'll just uh, remind the board, as uh, I suspect you're all well aware, since this is an application for a special permit for nonconformities, uh, the board must uh, deliberate and find uh, uh, that there will be no addition of any new nonconformity in order to grant the special permit for nonconformities and the proposed um, uh, and uh, we would need to make a finding based on the presentation of the applicant. And then the second component is that the board must also find that the application will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood uh, than the pre-existing non-conforming use or structure. And when we make that finding, uh, the board can consider factors such as size, scale, massing, volume as compared to the other structures in the neighborhood. Uh, and that's under section 9B2 of our zoning bylaws. And uh, with that, um, we will open up deliberations. Mr. Moore. Um, I, I really have um, no problem with this uh, proposal. Uh, clearly, it's not creating new nonconformities as presented. Um, and given the modest size of the addition at 200, or about 205 square feet, uh, I certainly don't see a problem um, with size scale massing at all with, uh, with the neighborhood. So um, I can support this for sure. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Delisle. Yes, I would agree with Mr. Moore. Uh, clearly, there's no addition of a new nonconformity, and I think that the addition as proposed uh, is will not be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood than uh, what's there currently. Uh, if there were to be a roof deck uh, suggested, I think that I, I might feel differently, but as it's currently drawn and currently uh, shown on the plans, I can support this application. All right. Thank you, Mr. Delisle. Ms. Webb? Uh, I agree with my colleagues. Uh, this is not going to be an addition of any new nonconformity, and um, it is not going to be substantially more detrimental to the neighborhood. The location of the addition just really fills in an area of the footprint, and um, it's not, I mean, the lot size is 20,000 square feet. It can definitely handle 200 foot addition. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, yeah, I too can support this. I think my colleagues have said it quite well. I mean, I would add, in addition to the large lot side, this this place has a lot of frontage as well. And you know, I'm familiar with this place. I walk by it, uh, and it's uh, actually think it's a very tasteful addition. It will be an enhancement to the neighborhood, but it it certainly doesn't uh, diminish the neighborhood. Thank you, Mr. Swanton and uh, Chairman Champetti. I I, uh, I agree, uh, and we'll also add that uh, this application does not appear to trigger the tree and sidewalk ordinance uh, in uh, under our um, city's bylaws. Um, so, um, with that, uh, we'll close that portion of the public hearing, and I will call for a. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the application for a special permit for nonconformities? I'll make a motion to approve the special permit for nonconformities for 284 Water Street, um, application number 2020-066. I'll second it, Rachel Webb. Thank you. Uh, motion is made by Mr. Moore and seconded by Ms. Webb. Um, calling the roll, Mr. Moore. Yes. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Ms. Webb. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yes. Rob Champetti, I vote yes. That's five in the affirmative. The ayes have it. The motion carries. And the application for special permit for nonconformities for 284 Water Street is approved. Um, thank you very much to uh, Attorney Wolf and Mr. Langus. Uh, good luck to Mr. and Mrs. Higgins. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, okay, the uh, next matter um, on our public hearing is the matter of 1 Williamson Avenue, uh, Boyle and Company LLC, care of Lisa Mead, uh, Mead Tallerman, Attorney Lisa Mead, Mead Tallerman and Costa LLC. The application is made uh, for a special permit, application number 2020-068 to re renovate an existing attached garage to create an in-law apartment. May we hear from the applicant, Attorney Mead. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and members of the board. Lisa Mead, Mead Tellerman Cost of 30 Green Street. On behalf of um, Chris Boyle of Boyle Construction uh, for Elizabeth Wilson, who's the owner of the property. Um, so this property is located in the R2 zoning district at 1 Williamson Avenue, which is to driving down Low Street, 
um, and you go up Williamson, it's the um, first ho one house up on the left after the house that's on the corner. So if you go to the next slide, Andy. Um, so the application is to convert the existing garage into an in-law apartment. Um, the property has existing non-conforming front yard setback, but this isn't being altered or extended. There will be no changes to the existing dimensions or the footprint, and the square footage of the pro proposed in-law apartment will be um, 50, 571 square feet. Uh, just so you know, the, the setback, front setback, is required to be 25 feet, and the current setback is 23.2 um, feet. Um, so under the ordinance, under section 12A, C of the ordinance, um, we meet the requirements for the square footage for an existing structure. So if you could move to the next slide, please, Andy. So um, on the lower part of this plan is the property. Um, and you can see we've highlighted um, the existing two-car garage that is connected um, by a breezeway um, to the main um, structure. And that footprint is not changing. Uh, Andy, if you could go to the next slide, please. These are the existing elevations. Um, so the only changes you're going to see are on the east elevation, which faces the front. The garage doors are going to go away. And on the west elevation that faces the rear, there's going to be a door added. And if you could go to the next slide, please. And there you go. So you see the change. They add windows to the front elevation instead of the garage doors. And there's an additional egress in the back on the west elevation. Thank you. You go to the next slide. And here's the floor plan. So you can see it's really, it's really a studio um, in-law. As you can see, uh, the bedroom is kind of back in the corner there. And there's a little kitchenette and a bathroom. So it's a very small um, in-law apartment. Um, the person that is going to occupy this in-law apartment, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, is the niece of the elderly woman who um, lives uh, in the main house. So if you can go to the next slide, Andy, I think it's important you can see the context. Um, so here, this is from my maps and you can see the parking areas here I wanted to show. So there are two parking spaces in front of the garage, now in-law apartment, um, which obviously has plenty of room, that's not gonna change. And then there's an additional parking area that exists on the side of the property, um, which will have obviously room for more than three cars in total in both of those areas, um, which is required under the ordinance. If you can go to the next slide, please. And this is just another view down the street um, from Google Maps so you can see the parking areas. And the next one, please, Andy. And then that's the main parking area in front of the garage. So if you go to the next slide, please, the um, requirements for an in-law apartment um, is that uh, it be um, occupied by grandparents, grandparents, sons, daughters, um, someone um, related by blood. Uh, and in this instance, um, it's the owner's niece. Um, she is very close to the owner, helps take care of her. Um, in our opinion, would be the equivalent of somebody who is um, like a child to the owner, um, in her opinion, and certainly related by um, blood. Um, and there's a strong need and desire for this arrangement as stated in the, um, in the ordinance. It's interesting, the ordinance says, um, the intent of the section is to allow parents and their children to live together where the need and desire so exists, so long as the proposed li living arrangement is not outweighed by any adverse impact upon the community, particularly the proliferation of unlawful rental units, which of course this would not be and then it also goes to talk about relationships by blood. So in this instance, we believe we meet the first criteria of the ordinance. You go. Um, then uh, the, the next is that the gross floor area isn't any larger than 700 square feet for existing, and this is 571 uh, square feet. Uh, we meet all the dimensional requirements of the property. It's pre-existing non-conforming, and we're not, we're not changing that, so it's a legal structure. Um, the zoning board um, is permitted to impose um, uh, reasonable conditions uh, which um, and must include at least the number of parking spaces plus one for the unit. So as I noted earlier, it has the required two parking spaces and we're adding one. Um, and then 
We are meeting all health and safety and building codes will be met with the construction. Obviously, we'll pull a building permit um, that's required. Uh, and then there are a number of commitments that are in section F to J, um, and I will go through those, um, which the applicant is um, required to comply with. Uh, and then the first is that the special permit, if it's granted, will be recorded at the registry, which of course it will. Um, and then on the 11th and 23rd months following the grant, um, it has to be um, renewed and the applicant will comply with this um, requirement. Uh, and then the special permit will expire if it's not renewed in three years, the applicant will comply with that requirement. Uh, if there's any, if it expires or stops being used as a um, in-law apartment, the kitchen or kitchen appliances that have been added have to be removed. The applicant would agree to comply with that requirement. Uh, and then the board can um, order inspections as it deems appropriate um, upon reasonable written notice um, to the homeowner and of course the applicant uh, would agree with this requirement. Uh, in addition, I provided today, and um, they were late in the afternoon, so I'm not sure if Caitlin or Diane were able to get them over to you, but two letters of support, um, one from Seven Williamson, which is as you're facing the house immediately on the right, and one from 214 Low Street, which is opposite the house on Williamson on the corner of Low and Williamson. So there are two letters of support that have been provided to the board. Um, with that, we hope that the board um, would grant this special permit for an in-law apartment um, in the existing structure as proposed, um, and thank you very much. Okay, Attorney Mead, thank you um, very much. Was there anything uh, further before we move, uh, move it along? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, closing that portion of the public hearing will now open up the um, the public hearing to comments from uh, members of the public. Again, if you wish to speak in support or opposition or just simply speak, um, please just raise your hand bottom right of your participant screen and Mr. Port will unmute your mic and we will recognize you. Anyone wishing to speak in support or opposition or simply speak in connection with the application for uh, an in-law apartment special permit for 1 Williamson Avenue. Seeing no hands, going once, going twice. Um, there being no hands, I will go ahead and close that portion of the public hearing and open up questions from the board. We'll begin uh, with um, Mr. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Champetti. I, I just have one question um, as far as the, the parking's not changing in front of what is the old garage. Will the um, Will the hard top be diminished at all, or is that going to stay the same? It, nothing is nothing is changing outside the the windows and the door and the interior of the garage. Everything else will be staying the same. Got it. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moore. Mr. Delisle. Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just a little concerned on the uh, section A of the ordinance with respect to the. Uh, occupation of the in-law apartment by a parent, grandparent, child, or grandchild. And I think that that phrase after that uh, word grandchildren separated by the comma, by blood or by marriage, modifies those four things and doesn't expand it. So I'm a little concerned here about uh, the relationship, especially in connection with section G of the ordinance, which requires the applicant to, uh, in the 11th and 23rd month, to go to the building department and certify under the pains and penalties of perjury that A, section A is correct. So if you could explain how that would work to me, I would appreciate that. Um, I will. So I, I think that, so first of all, if the board grants the permit, um, having complied with the ordinance, I don't, I don't have an issue at all with section G. Uh, but in addition, you know, it's interesting the the title of this section is called in-law apartment. Um, and technically, of course, um, an in-law isn't related by blood. Um, but we have, um, the board has granted plenty of, um, of in-law apartment permits for in-laws. Um, and so I think that the purpose of the ordinance is to provide family members 
uh, to live together and provide care for one another. And of course, the, the city is looking at potentially expanding this a little bit to encourage additional housing and affordable housing um, arrangements for both people who want to age in place um, in the city. But in this instance, uh, the, the person is a niece. Um, they're very forthright about that. Um, but essentially is the, treated as the daughter of this of Elizabeth, who is the owner of the house and is related by blood to her. Um, and so I understand what you're saying about the comma, but I think that the purpose and intent of the ordinance um, is, to, uh, is to make sure that a living arrangement exists. And if you go up to the upper part, um, that it's not outweighed by the adverse impact on the community, uh, to take particularly proliferation of unlawful rental units, which of course this would not be. Um, but the idea is to allow people to age in place together as a family. And um, in this instance, you know, I believe that the board in the past uh, and, and obviously the zoning code enforcement officer um, believed as she has approved this for a special permit application um, that this is a relationship by blood and the woman is treated as a child of the aunt, even though she's a niece. And um, I believe it fully complies and falls within section A. I completely understand what you're saying about the familial relationship. And I, you know, I feel as though th this is probably a, a wonderful arrangement that would, that would occur. However, I just don't think the ordinance says, uh, says that it allows for uh, a collateral descendant as opposed to a lineal descendant. So I'm having trouble with that. Uh, and with your respect to in-laws, I think that one in-law is always related by blood to one of the, the members of the, the married couple. So I, I'm a little confused by, by that comment. And then with regard to Section G, I, I still don't understand uh, how, how the homeowner has to go into the planning office on the 11th and 23rd month and swear under the pains and penalties of perjury that Section A is the... <laughs> The obligations there are met. I, I, if you could explain that to me, I just don't understand how that works. Sure. If the board finds that the proposed relationship falls under Section A, then they can certify when they go in under Section G that the it complies with the permit that was granted and the board had determined that uh, the relationship existed and complies with with paragraph G, paragraph A. Uh, otherwise, I have no uh, uh, problems with this application and no further questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Delisle. Uh, Mr. Webb, uh, Ms. Webb. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I do not have any issues with this application. I think um, it's a great opportunity for, um, as as attorney Mead has pointed out for the um, applicant to age in place with a family member related by blood. Um, Mr. Delisle's um, points are very interesting, but I think um, you know, the intent of the ordinance is definitely to enable family members to support other family members to stay in their homes long-term. And um, this scenario is, is achieving that, that's all. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Uh, Mr. Swanton. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm very sympathetic here. I mean, I was a caregiver once for a number of years and my heart goes out to every caregiver. It is, uh, it's a lot of responsibility. Um, and I can understand how these folks wanna make this work. I, I, I guess I have a question. I'm not sure I have a question for Attorney Mead. I have a question perhaps for our planning department or somebody who could please help me deal with the issue that uh, my colleague, Mr. Delisle brought up. I mean, I, I, I'd like to vote for what I think is the intent of this bylaw, that this niece is a family member, but that's not what the, by, that's not what the zoning ordinance says. I, and so could, I don't know, Andy or Jennifer or somebody, Caitlin explain, I, I don't get it. Are we allowed to interpret this bylaw as we'd like it or do we have to administer it as it's written? 
Uh, well, this is Andy. I, I won't speak with the zoning administrator, Jennifer Blanchet, who's here this evening, um, or Kate Sullivan, our planner, I, his planning director. I, I think that some of the provisions in a lot of local communities are, inter are written and perhaps interpreted too, too restrictive. And I think that whether the courts have currently or will in the future deem some of those provisions invalid um, because they're too restrictive in trying to define what a family is in, in today's modern age, I think that may be a problem you know we see down the road or a revision to the language that we see down the road um i do agree with you that i think the language as originally written and and probably adopted by the council had contemplated a more restrictive interpretation of that i think but at the same time i, I certainly do not object to the proposal here and i think that frankly from um not just the ordinance here but also in other communities I've seen. Um, I'm not sure that those provisions um, will be upheld at some, at least at some future date, if um, taken to court. So. Um, if I could, uh, Andy, this is Rob Champetti again, and uh, I'd like to hear from uh, uh, Jennifer Blanchet. I see that she's among our panelists. I just want to um, maybe give, if we can unmute uh, Jennifer's mic and just uh, get her quick thoughts on this. I, I have thoughts of my own as well. That I'll share. Hi, this is Jennifer Blanchet. I uh, I do understand that the language of the ordinance is very restrictive in this case. I think this applicant has been extremely forthcoming in uh, what the relationship in actuality is. Uh, that will be part. That is part of their application, and therefore it is part of the legal record. Uh, therefore, moving forward, should the uh, individual occupying that unit change, they would need to come to the city. Should there be any complaint or need for enforcement, and we would, should we find that it be anyone but this niece or a direct, you know, blood family member, there would be enforcement. So from my perspective, uh, you know, and as Andy indicated, our ordinance may be a little too restrictive to be backed up should there be uh, an issue or a challenge to it and therefore it was put forward uh, under this provision of the ordinance all right um miss blanchet thank you very much for that uh, that insight um i'll uh, i think did, did we have we heard from mr swanton um uh, yeah yeah i asked that question i'm good um, right thank you very much mr swanton and so uh, that brings it to me and i'll, I'll just share that for, for what it's worth i I, um, I agree with the consensus that, that we as a board uh, certainly have certain discretionary powers. Um, and while there is a rigor to the letter of the ordinance, there's also a rigor to the spirit of the ordinance. And that's why we have you know, individuals and not bots that sit on these boards and commissions. It's so that we can run through the lens of life and ourselves and our individual experiences, you know, the, the proposals and try to find the, you know, the empathy and the organic sort of spirit of the ordinance while being true to the rigor of the law. Um, and in this instance, I'm moved by the, um, the fact that I, I find under these circumstances, and we may all find that should I have any colleagues that agree with me in this sentiment, that you know, there, should, there might be some court in some imagined future that, that uh, you know, determines that we have erred in our discretion. But unless and until that happens, I, I'm willing to um, to put out there that I believe that it is within the spirit um, and the intent of our ordinance that we allow for the um, the residents of uh, of individuals to age in place and, and facilitate the the fluid and malleable dynamic of the family unit as it continues to remain fluid and malleable you know and change with the times and I think this is a perfect case in point of how that happens um, you know, the, the notion that it be an in-law and only an in-law seems inconsistent with the spirit of, of that. And I think that it's certainly within our ability, should we choose, to, um, to run this and read this through the organic lens of the details and the circumstances. I think these applicants have made a very um, palpable case that a niece is equivalent to a child, uh, equivalent of a child to an owner related by blood. This is a, um, a circumstance where we have to um, I think we are we are well served to take note of the details and, and these details for me very powerfully say this is the spirit of this part of the ordinance though some future court may determine that I'm wrong I, I'm willing to you know take that position now so I, I certainly support it for those reasons as well 
Um, any, um, any members of the board um, wish to um, add anything further? Seeing uh, no hands, do we have a, um, a motion to approve? Uh, this is Rachel Webb. I'll make a motion to approve. Um, let's see. Sorry. Make a motion to approve uh, 1 Williamson Avenue, uh, case 2020-68 special permit renovate an existing attached garage to create an in-law apartment. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Do we have a second? Second it, Mr. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Moore. So the motion is made uh, by Ms. Webb and seconded by Mr. Moore. Uh, Mr. Moore. Sorry about that. Yes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Delisle. No. Ms. Webb. Yes. Mr. Swanton. Yeah, I think uh, my experience as a caregiver has m moves me to a yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Swanton. And Rob Champetti, I vote yes. Uh, that's four in the affirmative, one in the negative. Um, the uh, ayes have it, the motion carries, and the application for special permit to renovate an attached garage to create an in-law apartment, uh, 2020-068, 1 Williamson Avenue, um, is uh, approved. Thank you, um, members of the board, and thank you, uh, Attorney Mead, uh, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, moving on then to the last matter uh, on our agenda. Um, I uh, will note for the record that um, I will be recusing myself on the, uh, the board discussion component that uh, is number four of, on, our, uh, on our agenda this evening. Um, and we'll be turning over the virtual gavel to, uh, to our vice chair, Mr. Moore. Um, because it's the last matter on the agenda, I will also be bidding good night to you all. Uh, I will uh, leave the, uh, the Zoom meeting and leave it to uh, Mr. Moore to, uh, to handle that last application uh, matter as well as um, uh, the final closing of our meeting. Thank you all very much and uh, have a good meeting. Um, and uh, Mr. Moore, the gavel is yours. Thank you, Mr. Champetti. Um, as uh, the chairman aptly stated, this is the, the final item um, on the agenda tonight. And it is a, uh, for 468th Street, special permit nonconformities, application 2020-30. Um, this um, application was approved at our 9-8 meeting. This is actually going to be an open discussion of um, a board discussion and deliberation um, that's con that will be uh, considering reopening um, the application um, in, in the public domain. Um, and there's the reason behind this, I think, for, for applicants, uh, I mean, for uh, attendees that are still out there, uh, first of all, I should know that this is um, simply a nice way for the public to see and, and hear what uh, what the board is thinking with this open discussion uh, and deliberation. Um, public comment is is not appropriate or sought uh, of any kind, and um, we will be going over an issue that came up after the nine eight meeting uh, during the public review process. And, and this is a nice um, review from our planning department that I thought made a lot of sense to to use as an intro for anyone still listening on this, um, as opposed to the, with the interested parties, of course, listening in. Um, the applicant submitted a, a, a floor area ratio density comparison map. And this had been something um, that the board had been asking for um, in multiple meetings before the 9-8 decision uh, in helping us to decide or helping the board to decide uh, on the appropriateness of the proposal. Um, a member, uh, Ken Swanton and other board members expressed uh, during, uh, expressed mostly during the last two meetings of their concern uh, with the data that was being provided to analyze the, the floor area ratio or the FAR. Um, it's also important to note that during the meeting, the board approved the project um, that the department, the planning department had been contacted by a neighbor expressing some concerns uh, which were in line with Mr. Swanton. And in fact, I believe this is the immediate butter who, who in that final meeting at 9-8 um, was a little incredulous as to how some of the numbers were put together for his property in particular. Uh, so that raised some concerns with Mr. Swanton as well. Um, and finally, the, uh, the decision on this project has not been issued yet. Um, and in light of the information that Mr. Swanton um, or the work that he put in on, on putting some information together, we thought it was appropriate to have an open discussion as a board over um, his findings in, in order to determine whether uh, as a board, we wanted to reopen this for public uh, discussion 
or let the the original uh, application decision stand as of uh, the decision made on 9-8. So with that, um, I know haphazard introduction, as, as, as I could uh, put this together, um, I'm, we're going to open this up to um, to Mr. Swanton to discuss uh, briefly what his findings were on the FAR and where his concerns were um, after our decision. Um, before we, we get into that, though, I will ask uh, first that um, that Andy Port, if he if he had anything to add to that or to, to clean that up a little bit, um, now is the time to speak. And then after that, of course, um, we are going to be using the guidance of Attorney Jonathan Eichmann from KP Law to make sure that uh, that everything we do uh, moving forward with this discussion uh, is done properly. So, Andy, if you had any thoughts, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, just uh, uh, per, I think, a conversation we had had earlier today, I just wanted to make sure that in whatever action the board does, whatever discussion it does, it does so um, procedurally as a guided by Copeland and Page. So um, Jonathan is here this evening um, to make sure that if you have any questions along those lines, that he can answer them. Um, I, and as I understand it, and Jonathan, feel free to jump in, um, the first question and foremost should, for the board should be whether to reopen the hearing. Um, any question about reconsideration obviously would, would follow in, in a hearing process if the hearing is, is reopened. Um, but I think uh, there obviously needs to be some sort of explanation, I assume, tonight in order to, um, of the, the issue that might be involved or the, mis the information that might be needed for a uh, reopening of the hearing for the board to make a determination as to whether or not to reopen the hearing. So I think that's where Ken's um, review comes in. I'll defer to Jonathan if he has any thoughts on um, procedural steps or any other considerations the board might want to have. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is John Eichmann from KP Law. Um, Mr. Chairman, the board, um, do you want my comments now on this, if, if it be of some assistance? Uh, I, I think it would be helpful in, in shaping, um, you know, the discussion after we um, try to digest what uh, Mr. Swan might have for us. Sure. Um, so uh, the way this is, has been presented to me, um, Mr. Swanton, um, came forward with this um, information, and I believe it's been distributed to the board, um, a collection of his um, his research with the assessor's office uh, in comparing on FAR and comparing that to the um, the application materials that were submitted by the applicant. Um, the information Mr. Swanson submitted or wants the board to consider was submitted after the public hearing was closed and also submitted after the vote was taken. So in essence, um, this is what we would call after submitted information. Um, the board may consider this information if it so chooses. Um, to do so, in my opinion, it needs to reopen the public hearing because this is relevant information. It should be considered in the public hearing process. The board is not required to consider after submitted information. It can simply say, we've closed the public hearing. We had the information we needed. Um, we're going to continue on the course that we've already set. Um, so I think at this point, as Andy pointed out, it's, it's really up to the board. This information has been brought forward. Do we want to consider this information as part of this application in a public hearing process? Um, that would be a decision for the board to make. If that is a yes, um, then the public hearing would have to be reopened with whatever notice is required. And if uh, the continuity of notice has been um, has stopped, then uh, hearing notes would have to be reissued as if it was a new hearing. Um, once that happens, then of course you can continue with the, the public hearing on this application. Um, and having considered this material, uh, decide whether you want to reconsider your initial vote. Um, so I think that's where we are at this point. Um, Andy, um, asked for my help and assistance with the procedural issue. So I think that's what I'm primarily outlining here. I did not look at or weigh in on the actual question, substantive question raised by Mr. Swanson here, which would be the comparison of the FAR. And Jonathan, this is Andy. Uh, if you could, just for the board, um, I, I think uh, Ken had put together some slides sort of summarizing um, his review and his thoughts on the FAR analysis. Um, would, in your opinion, would it be appropriate to review those or have Ken review those for the rest of the board members in making their judgment whether to reopen the hearing? Yeah, I think that's fine. Um, again, with, as long as everyone understands that the information is being submitted to the board 
for its determination as to whether um, the hearing should be reopened to have, give it full consideration. So um, discussion of the substantive uh, aspects of this um, should should be withheld at this point. Really the question before the board is, is this something that we should take into consideration now before we issue a decision on this matter? Thank you, Jarvis. Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Uh, I think with that, we will proceed uh, to Mr. Swanton with, um, I guess, a, a summary or brief overview of what he found. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have some a slide set to go through here with what I found uh, to talk about the use of neighborhood FAR, basically, at this hearing that we had on September 8th, uh, when we reviewed the 468th Street Plum Island application. Uh, first little background, if we to remind us all, we go to the next slide, Andy. This started back on July 14th. The first hearing we had was actually postponed several times for May, but the first hearing we had was in July. And it was for a proposal to demolish the house shown on the left there, which had an existing FAR of 0.21, and replace it with uh, a two-story house with a FAR of 0.30, uh, which was above the city's uh, flooring ratio of 0.25. So at this meeting, the ZBA members expressed concern with the proposed FAR and asked to see data on the neighbors. So a month later on the next slide, as you may recall, we had our second hearing on August 11th and we saw this chart, this map that showed, um, I guess in total, I think we counted about 150 properties in this map of which some were selected to identify FARs for. And the red ones were above the 0 0.30 that was proposed and the black ones were below. Uh, the applicant also in this meeting revised their proposed FAR on their house, on their proposed house from 0.3 to 0.32 uh, as they had calculated incorrectly. Uh, during the discussion, we asked, uh, we noticed that the house, the proposed house here, which is grayed in, um, we didn't see a lot of uh, FAR numbers for the houses around it. So we asked the applicant to, to please, you know, this looks like an interesting chart, but please do it for the immediate vicinity of the house. Um, so that got us to the third hearing, which is on the next page. And this is what we saw. And here you got the same grade in house there at uh, 468th Street. And they did the FAR calculations for all the houses around it. And in this case now, out of the 23 homes, 13 of them were colored in red. They were above the 0.32 FAR that was proposed for this house. And only four of the houses um, were within the city's 0.25 FAR regulation. So, I mean, it clearly looked like the whole neighborhood was already dense. Um, so on the next slide, uh, shows our decision. Basically, we voted after we saw that information, we voted five to nothing to approve. And I think our minutes are very important here because they show that this neighborhood FAR data that we had in front of us when we voted that night was pivotal. I mean, Mr. Delisle said in yellow here that he was among the group that had asked for the FAR study and upon seeing the results, he had no questions and in light of the information provided, the applicant has met the requirements. Ms. Webb, said she was satisfied with the provided data and she'd like to see the assessor's information to add the FAR calculations for the whole island. I remember she said that. I sort of thought that would be a good idea. Um, I said the board would not be able to den deny an applicant with a FAR that is consistent with other properties in the neighborhood. And Mr. Moore also said that he appreciates the new information, which shows the proposal would not be detrimental to the neighborhood. A lot of consistency there that this was very pivotal this information. Now on the next slide shows there was another person who spoke at this meeting, who was the only abutter who spoke, um, which identified themselves as being at house 15, which is, as you can see in the map here, right next to the applicant's house. Um, and lot 15 is actually a double lot. And I think it's interesting what they said as highlighted down here in yellow. 
They said they had a hard time believing the FAR in their house exceeds the standard. They asked what values were used. And the response from the applicant's architect was, oh, we used the gross floor area of 3,400 square feet from the assessor's data. To which the owner of this house said, I don't know how you got that. That would be a strange number. So that's what happened at the hearing. After the hearing, I got to thinking about everything that just happened. And on the next slide, I, I looked into to remind ourselves, what is the definition that we should be using for FAR for floor area? And this is right out of the zoning ordinance. Floor area gross shall mean the total square feet of floor space within the outside dimensions of a building, including each floor level without any deductions for halls and closets and things. So if you take that definition now and you look at the various houses that were in this study, let's go back, for example, on the next page to house 15. And here's actually a picture of house 15. Um, you can see where the 3,400 came from. Uh, in fact, there it is in the middle. It's the assessor's gross. It's actually 3,440. But it's made up of not just the living area, but also the decks, the open porch, the canopy, the attic. If you add all those things up, you get 3,400. You divide it into the square footage, you do indeed get 0.38. And that's why this house was colored in red. But if you don't include all those extra things, it's only 0.21. Now, to really understand how this works, I, I did talk to our zoning enforcement administrator and she was very helpful. And, she said, yeah, decks, decks should not be included. That's not in the enclosed space and certainly not the open porch either that's shown here in the picture or, or the canopy. But she indicated the pull down attic was a little trickier because the ordinance, the zoning ordinance is not real crisp on what, how much of an attic is included. So in that case where it's silent, you go to the, to the uh, building code and that indicates where there's headroom, you count it. So in that attic, you can kind of see on the end of the drawing there that in the middle of the attic, maybe you can stand up, uh, but certainly not on the two edges. Um, and actually the way the math works on this thing is if about a third of that attic is headroom, then it still gets within the 0.25 uh, far. So I'm not surprised the owner of this house stood up and said, gee, I thought I was in compliance. Uh, in contrast, if you look at 468th Street, they had a FAR of 0.32, but they did not include their decks or whatever else the assessors may conclude needs to be added in here. Uh, and that's appropriate for the, for the FAR definition. So that one was done correctly at 0.32. The 0.38 was not though. We were looking at apples and oranges here. We were looking at incomparable numbers. And it wasn't just this house. If you go to the next page, it was every house in that FAR study was overstated. They all had areas that should not be counted. Most Plum Island houses have decks. In fact, 20 of these 23 houses had decks. All of them were counted. None of them should have been counted in this FAR study. A lot of them had sheds and garages and even carports. And those things were counted. They should not have been counted. And then you get into the low headroom areas, the half stories and the three quarter stories and attics and basements, all of which were counted and many of those areas should not have been counted. So I think that rather than most of the neighbors being colored in red and over the proposed 0.32, I think most were probably under the city's 0.25 maximum. Most of them I think were probably in compliance. I say probably because to be sure, you, you can't really calculate a FAR without seeing the floor elevations to determine headroom. Now, my next slide is something I just sort of realized this afternoon in looking at these two drawings. If you look at the picture on the left, this is the map we saw in August, the first time they did it. But it's not the whole 150 houses, it's just the houses right around the applicant. No, there's the applicant's house colored in dark gray. You'll notice there's four other houses, one of which is colored in red because it's over the far, and the other four are not. Then when you go the exact same area to the September map, all of a sudden, all five houses are colored in red. And how can that be? They're the same houses. And if you dig into it, because they did provide the data that went with these charts, 
you see that the square footage they used in these two maps on these two different dates for the exact same houses was different. In the August farm map, for example, on the first one at 1070th Street, they used 1656 square feet. And that same house was shown as 3209 square feet in September, and there, that's why it got colored in red. What happened, if you look at the assessor data, in 1656, the first number back in August, all those numbers came from the assessor's records for the living area, the much more conservative definition of square footage, and typically what realtors use when they sell a house. They describe your living area, not your attics and all the other things and decks and stuff. The numbers on the right that were used in September were the gross square footage, including the decks and everything else. No wonder the whole neighborhood got colored in red, or much of it, most of it. So I, something happened between August and September, and I say up top that the, the FAR data went bad between those two dates. Um, my last slide is just my little summary of why I think we need to reopen this hearing. Because as I described, that neighborhood FAR data that was used was pivotal in our unanimous decision to approve this. And yet the data has now, it appears to be wrong. The next reason is so that we can ask the applicant to explain what happened. Maybe there's something I'm missing. Maybe there's a reason that this happened that's not obvious. The other thing is now that we've uncovered this, if we're going to be fair, in addition to asking the applicant, we should ask the abutters to comment on this new information. And once we've heard from both sides, then I think we could make a quality decision on whether to let our decision stand or whether we think it was based on faulty information. And that's basically what my concern is, and I thank you for letting me raise it. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Swanton. It's um, uh, a very interesting work. Um, Given this presentation and given the um, advice from uh, Mr. Eichmann, um, I believe the, the only question that the board has right now is to make a determination as to whether we, we are gonna reopen this to a public hearing process. Does anyone have any comment? Uh, Chairman, this is uh, Mr. Shag, and I, I, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, comment to the presentation and, and thank you, Mr. Swanton, for all that work. Um, I think one of the things that concerns me is, uh, you know, obviously this data, uh, like a lot of statistical data, uh, can be modified, tweaked, changed to suit any, uh, uh, you know, a direction someone might want to go. Uh, and in the example that Mr. Swanton was using, that attic, he had subtracted the attic out of 1,000 square feet. If you put it back in, because of the way the, uh, the rule is written, um, this house does indeed break 0 0.30 again. So I, I think, I think we, we could end up going down a, a pretty good-sized rat hole with this data. Um, and I do remember during the presentation that Attorney Mead made the comment that the first um, the first time they looked at this data, they used the living area, and when they read the ordinance, they realized it's not living area, it's gross square footage, and they went right to the assessor's data. So I, I, I think, uh, if, if anything, um, they tried to use the way the ordinance was written. And uh, with that said, I'm a little uncomfortable, uh, you know, running down a rat hole with this uh, for a decision that was already made. I, I agree it would be nice if uh, the assessor's office were to correct the data to, to be more compliant with what we're looking for. I don't know how you fix things like headroom in a house and headroom in a basement. Um, someone would ha actually have to do that calculation, so it's difficult. Um, I, th th those are just my comments, uh, my read on this. Uh, thank you very much. Does anyone else have any any comments? This is Mr. Delisle. Um, I I'm a little bit confused. Uh, I think between Mr. Swanton and Mr. Uh, Mr. Shagan, I thought what 
Mr. Swanton said was that the attic, you only use the part that would be, uh, have adequate headroom, uh, which wouldn't be the whole 1,000 square feet. Is, is that right, Mr. Swanton? Would just be a portion of that? I believe you said a third. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah, I, the, um, the direction I got from our code enforcement officer was that you only use the part that, that, with six feet of headroom. And I was simply making the observation that you obviously can't stand up in the whole thing just looking at the side of it, but you're never going to know for sure without seeing construction drawings. Uh, I, I can certainly imagine if we reopen the hearing, I wouldn't be at all surprised to see the person who stood up at the hearing who owns this house indicate that, yeah, they, it does meet the requirement. I, I do think, it, you know, it's not just the attic, including the decks in all these houses. I mean, there's, there's no way the deck should have been included. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, anyway, I hope I answered your question, Mr. Delisle. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think that, you know, we need to make sure as a board that the data and the representations that are being made to the board are correct and are, are being uh, compiled honestly and properly. And I, I think that, you know, we need to we ask some questions uh, in connection with this, with this application. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Delisles. Anyone else have any, any comments in reaction to what we've seen and what we've heard? This is Andy, could I offer something? Please do. Um, I, I, obviously the board has to have a discussion about this particular um, FAR analysis and, and what to do about it. Um, I, I think to me though, it goes back to comments that we've raised previously about whether to approve expansions on Plum Island. Um, at all uh, at this point, recognizing sea level rise and things like that. My concern would actually be um, looking back at this more globally is, does it really make sense, uh, rather than getting into the weeds of looking at FIR analysis and how that is done, which I agree, um, this analysis shows that, you know, there's some poor use of data, um, inaccurate data, um, and, and it can be sort of contorted to, you know, suit a certain argument. Um, to me, the real lesson here, I think going back in time is, does it really make sense to even look at FAR for adjacent properties um, at, you know, and get into the weeds over that when determining whether or not a proposed development on a particular lot, the subject that's in question um, is proposed because I think that you, you risk running into a pretty obvious argument everyone's going to make, which is, uh, well, my neighbor has a house this big or wants to have a house this big or just got permitted for one, therefore I should too. And to me, that would just multiply endlessly on Plum Island. That seems to um, run contrary to the actual purposes of the ordinance. If you go back and read the purposes of the Plum Island Overlay District, um, to me, that, that gives me pause when I think about whether the ZBA should be granting variances for expansions on the island. Um, I think this FIR analysis, um, um, you know, the postmortem analysis of that hearing process illustrates that, you know, data can be used to um, suit various outcomes, depending on what you're trying to show. Um, and I think that what happened between the several meetings earlier on was there was um, the board got, you know, stuck in a sort of a rut, if you will, debating how the FIR analysis should be done um, throughout the neighborhood, which is a totally valid point to bring up. Um, but I think that, you um, I always try to stick, take a step back more globally with these issues and see, you know, what's the bigger picture here. And to me, the bigger lesson learned that I would, I would hope stays with the board, regardless of, of this matter is one being critical of what information is provided and how accurate and relevant it is. Um, and, um, and, and in terms of relevancy, the more particular part of it, is it relevant to the um, relief that's being requested here? In this case, the, the question was, is this proposed development more detrimental to the district? Um, and what was being proposed or what was being shown as evidence of that not being a problem was, well, the neighbors all have big houses. Um, so I just wanted to point that, that issue out. Thank you. All good points. Does anyone else have anything to, uh, to add to the discussion? Yeah, yeah I just wanted to comment on Nadie's comment. Sure. Um, I'm very sympathetic, Andy, with your comment about overdevelopment on Plum Island. You know, one after another, if, if larger houses go in, it adds up to a lot over, over the years. 
Um, but I still think there's a problem if somebody gives us data that is shows us that the whole neighborhood's colored red and is very dense, and then it turns out the data was wrong. I think to base a decision when the data was appears to be clearly wrong, we won't know unless we open it up and ask them, but to base to have that decision stand when we were misled, in my opinion, I think is not something we should be doing. We should be encouraging people to give us good quality data that we can make a good decision on. If we find out later that the decision was wrong, that the data was wrong, I, 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 don't, I don't think we should just, you know, try to get the next one. I think we should stop and ask, hey, what's going on? Is there something we're missing? Is the data, why did you show that data? Because that was what, if you go back and listen to the tape, that's what carried the day, that chart. And I, I think it's, it's, we should be looking into it. Thank you, Mr. Swan. And I'm, I, I just will take a, a moment to, uh, to chime in with um, compelling argument for, for reopening the, the hearing in that I, I agree that, you know, if we're going to make a, a decision based on data and the, the ordinance, especially as it is with the, the PIOD requirements, includes this. It, it's really hard, I think, as a board to call a hard stop on things if it's in the ordinance and just say, well, we know now we're not supposed to, to consider this because it's globally not the thing to do. And, and while I get the, the desire um, to not encourage uh, a lot of growth on the island, um, it the far is in the ordinance it's something that that is considered that is presented and, and i'm i'm kind of maybe of the opinion that if we can't depend on the data and don't have a mechanism to call someone out if they are misrepresenting in their application what they're doing um then we, we kind of are rubber stamping everything so anyway that's my my two cents there on that I have a few things to say. Um, this is a very interesting discussion, first of all. And um, secondly, I'd like to commend Mr. Swanton for his tireless um, analysis on this subject. I think it was excellent work. And um, the fact that with this particular application, the decision has not been written up or um, finalized yet gives us a certain window. Um, I think, I think we need to reopen this, I really do. Um, I think that the data speaks very loudly that, um, you know, we were, we were operating under um, erroneous data. And um, although I hear, Andy, what you were saying about how, um, you know, we should be just looking at the, the case before us on its own and look at it within the larger context of the whole island and development. Um, I'm not feeling right about moving forward without relooking at this um, because of the data being incorrect. I think that's all I'm going to say. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Is, uh, is anyone else looking to make a comment, add to the discussion? something that we haven't covered or talked about in the, on the grander subject of um, looking at this from of the macro, should we perhaps reopen this for a public hearing process? Uh, this is uh, Brendan Banovic. I'd like to just add a few comments uh, Please. real quick. Yep. Um, I, I agree with the work that Ken did. I think it was uh, impressive. I think reopening the case will allow us to uh, probably gain further clarity on this uh, FAR calculation, because I think with the Plum Island Overlay District, this is going to come up again in the future. And having, um, being able to talk through this in a lot more detail, I think will give us an opportunity to really hammer down this equation. Even it is listed out in there, but I think there is, as we found a lot of uh, gray 
and being able to talk through this and you know figure and learn from this uh, case, I think will help us quite a bit. So I, I, I do kind of agree with Ken on that, and I just wanted to make that point. Thank you, Mr. Vanderbilt. Did I have myself on mute for that whole thing? Yeah, you do. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so with that being said and all the discussion done, um, it appears to be done. If anyone else has any points, just jump in. But I believe what's before us now um, is to make a decision and should we reopen this for public hearing? And unless I'm mistaken and, and someone wants to correct, with, correct me with that, and that would be, I guess, directed at uh, Mr. Eichmann. But um, the, the consideration now is are we going to reopen this for public hearing process in light of um, Mr. Swanton's work uh, excellent work by the way I do um, echo everyone it's a, you know great job in, in putting in the, the time to do the detailed analysis of something that was uh, of concerning to you uh, this is Andy I would just note uh, having spoken with Jonathan earlier today obviously the there'd be a need to re-advertise the subject hearing as if it were new. Obviously, the Jonathan mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. continuity to the hearing at this point because it's been closed. Um, so, so the notice of that, the continuity of the notice, uh, we would reissue notice for the hearing traditional 14 days prior and so forth. Um, uh, you would obviously want to work, pick a date uh, that makes sense on the calendar and advise all the parties, obviously the applicant, original applicant, if that's the case where the board goes. I'm just wondering uh, for the board's benefit if Jonathan had any other um, suggestions or advice with respect to proceeding if the board uh, does elect to reopen the hearing. Um, this is John Eichmann again. Uh, no, not not particularly. Um, I think you know, the board understands what the criteria are if they reopen the hearing and there will be a full public discussion um, obviously with the applicant contributing on what um, the FBI FAR means and how it should be calculated. And uh, to the chairman's comments, uh, yeah, I think what's before the board right now is, um, strictly speaking, a motion to reopen the hearing. Thank you, uh, Andy, and thank you, uh, Attorney Eichmann. So with that said, um, I, I, time has come, I guess, to entertain a motion if someone has one. Mr. Delisle, I'll make, I'll make a motion uh, to reopen the public hearing regarding the application for a special permit for nonconformities uh, for 468th Street, matter number 2020-30. I'll second it, Rachel Webb. All right, we have a motion made by Mr. Delisle, seconded by Ms. Webb, to uh, reopen public hearing process for application 2020-030. Uh, with that, we go to uh, the vote. Uh, Mr. Champetti has recused himself. Uh, Mr. Delisle. I'm sorry, do we need to specify no. which date the meeting oh, do we have to? Yeah, do we have to, that's a good question. Do we need to pick a date now? Uh, no, we need to check and verify. Uh, Got it. Yeah, we'll take care of that uh, in the okay. But we do need to require, uh, do the deal with the required uh, advertising statutes, uh, you know, the 14 days prior to the hearing and all that. So. Very good. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I will go, I will go back to um, the vote as we have a, a motion to reopen this uh, public hearing on this application 2020-030. Uh, again, made by Mr. Delisle, seconded by Ms. Webb, and we'll go to the vote now. Mr. Delisle. Yes. Uh, Ms. Webb. Yes. Mr. Swanton? Yes. Mr. Chagnon? No. Um, and I'm going to Mr. Banovic? Yes. 
and Mr. Moore is a yes. Uh, with that, I think we have too many yeses. I think the five votes don't include Mr. Benedict. That's right. So uh, we have four in the affirmative. So we, the vote is uh, motions approved to reopen the public hearing process and we'll proceed accordingly. Okay, the office will uh, circle back with the board, obviously with the date and with the uh, applicant for this particular project and obviously the butters notices and so forth. And um, Jonathan, thank you for your time tonight. Yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, with that, that concludes uh, the board's um, itinerary for the night. Um, so with that, the only thing we need is maybe a motion to adjourn. Mr. Delisle, I'll make a motion to adjourn uh, the meeting for this evening. I'll second it, Ken Swanton. Thank you, Mr. Delisle makes a motion to adjourn, seconded by Mr. Swanton, and we're going to do a, uh, a voice call. All in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.